Welcome all to the, uh, to the Green Future session during which we will cover um, sustainable agenda for cleaner and more competitive businesses, consumption models and society as a whole. Um, let me introduce you to the to our main uh, moderator of the session, uh, Anna Brusa, who is just connecting right now live. Hi, Anna. And our speakers. Hi, Anya. Adam, hi, Josh, and Michal. Well, I, I, I let you start the session and uh, and 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 have fun and enjoy and, and enjoy uh, the inspiring the inspiring uh, panel. Wonderful! Thank you very much, Kasla. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, this has been a great uh, break, lunch break, and it's great to uh, to be back at the Polish Tech Day uh, with a World Stage session. This is a Designing the Green Future panel uh, discussion. Um, my name is Anna Brusta, and I do have the honor to moderate this session with the fantastic lineup of speakers that are here with us. Uh, I would love to introduce uh, uh, the, the fellows first so that you, you know exactly who's there. Uh, I know everyone, like each and every of us, actually has a uh, an, an account on Hopin, so you can you can write up to us. You can see a little bit of our profiles and so on, and please do uh, use it and and reach out to uh, any of uh, any of the speakers if you if you just feel like you want to be connected. Um, I would love to welcome Anna Grabowska, who is a sustainable finance manager representing European Federation for Transport and Environment. Um, Hello, everybody. Yeah, and you, if you were in search of some European Green Deal experts, uh, you actually found one right now. Um, Anna can reveal the secrets of EU taxonomy to you and the reporting requirements and many, many more. And we will be able to hear a little bit about that today. Uh, please, everyone, welcome Josh, Brit Josh Brito, a co-founder co of a clean tech startup, uh, Make Grow Lab. Uh, we will be able to hear and feel his passion to um, sustainability and design. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Next one on our uh, on our lineup is Michał Lesotski, who's a partner at the EEC Ventures uh, that is managing responsible investment funds in Poland, including one of the uh, most active uh, CDC that's acting in in this country. And last but not least, Adam Piekarski, who's very busy here today during the Polish Tech Day. He's also going to attend a different session. Uh, he's a co-founder of Trigo. Uh, and uh, he's going to share with us a, a story of, a developing, of developing a citizen-friendly technology. I would say just put it in a, uh, in a very short terms uh, like this. So welcome again. Um, uh, if you allow me to introduce a little bit this session, and then we will move into speaking to our fantastic, uh, fantastic um, panelists and having a, a conversation. So th this panel is opening the what stage, but the truth is that we just can't address uh, what without actually knowing um, the, the, even the, the, especially the sustainability challenge without uh, the why and how. So this is just totally simply interconnected. So um, the what will never make sense without understanding the both what, why and how, sorry about that. That's the DNA of the complex world uh, that we are living in. Everything is dependable on other elements. And during this session, we will discuss how Polish startups, how innovators, policymakers, like other stakeholders can actually contribute to the future oriented agenda. We will also question whether uh, some considerable investments are required to develop green, greener technologies um, that actually benefit product life cycles, transportation networks, other major industries, many, like really many, many more aspects of our everyday life. We will also uh, learn about real examples and stories of people innovating towards a greener future. Um, I can't wait anymore to move to our speakers. Um, so these are people that are not only dreaming about sustainable future, but they are actually first and foremost contributing to making it happen. And that's why this makes it all uh, even more exciting because we are touching one of the uh, um, sexist topics in the world right now, especially uh, when we are on some business co business conferences. 
but uh, like how you do it and and what is sustainability? What is green technology? What is the green, green uh, sustainable future for us is actually what makes it more exciting because um, it's really a great, uh, a, a new uh, phenomenon that we are um, um, honored to be part of and, and, and developing. So the first round I would love to um, um, move now to is actually around um, why don't you guys try and shine and share here with us, with our audience, uh, a statement of yours of on innovating towards a sustainable world um, by presenting an experience, an inspiration, or a project of yours, of your choice, actually. It might also be a provocation, something that will tell us how and like why are you innovating? You think that you are innovating towards sustainable future, sustainable world. I would love to hear um, around that, so so maybe some glitter will actually will actually um, uh, we will bring some some glitter to the to the room. Um, if I may ask, maybe Josh to start this one. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you, thank you everybody who, who put this uh, together, and thank you for having me. Um, so to move on to your question, um, I would say you know something that's that that is uh, is very important for all of us and something that's necessary for for our for all of us to do is to kind of think about the way that we about the way that we produce things you know because as as most of you know uh you know for many decades now we've been producing in a very linear way right we uh we take uh many of our natural resources from 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 the earth you know we uh um we uh, exploit them and pretty much use them until they're almost gone, right? And at and the end product, most of the time, you know, um, it it just you know, how can I explain this? You know, it 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 just doesn't go back. You know, it just seems to have just like one use, and then it's just put there at the end. And one very important thing that we need to do is kind of just more um, uh, adopt this, this this concept of being circular. You know, this circular economy. And uh, the reason I say that. Um, and one good example of that is some is what we do at Make Grow Lab. Um, pretty much what we do at Make Grow Lab, uh, for those of you for those of you that don't know, is what we do is we take unwanted uh, food waste. Right? You know, we're not going out there uh, uh, creating a bunch of crops so that we can harvest and use it towards the material. No, what we're doing is we're taking something that people consider as waste, and we're finding a new purpose for it and making it into something that has a lot more value. More, a lot more value than just you know for example um making into material uh you know it, it's it's something that has a second life that can be reused so pretty much we take this we, we take this waste uh we turn it into alternative to materials such as plastic packaging or leather and at the end of that use you know instead of it just being i don't know thrown away and you know trying to decompose and biodegrade for years and years, what it does is in a matter of months, you know, it breaks down into the soil. You can break it down into your garden, provides nutrients, you know, which then enables you to grow food, you know, to, to take care of your family. And this is what kind of, it's like a symbiotic process of nature, right? This is, this is in a way, the definition of a circular economy, right? Taking something, right? Just as nature has intended it and continuing the cycle. And this is something that I believe is very important in order for us to create green innovation uh, today. Thank you very much, Josh, for sharing the, uh, the, the, the what is the uh, solution that you're working on at Make Grow, Grow Lab. That's really, really impressive to hear. Uh, if we may move then to uh, Adam. Uh, what would be your inspiration or, uh, or something to share around how you work around sustainability? Just unmuting. Yeah. I, was just, I was just saying to myself, let me just unmute. I mean, just on the point of, uh, of, jo of what Josh mentioned, we, uh, at, a, at, a, at a macro scale, we're looking at improving the way people move through, through, through uh, city centers. Yeah, transport today uh, accounts for around 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the EU. So we're looking at a, a solution that can reduce the um, the pollution, the improve the air congestion, but just taking sort of following on directly uh, from Josh's uh, point, we're actually in negotiations. Our, our vehicle is a, a two seater vehicle where people sit in tandem. It's made of uh, the cabin is made of composite, 
And we're actually speaking to a company at the moment in the United Kingdom that builds cabins for delivery vehicles. And they uh, utilize over 5,000 PET bottles in each cabin. And they reduce the weight of the vehicle by 400 kilos. So, I mean, basically, if you think about the amount of energy you need to move 400 kilos and the amount of energy you need to stop 400 kilos, that in itself is a, is a saving. But then you're also bringing in uh, recycling, as, uh, as Josh said, in the circle community, the, uh, the pet bottles. Our estimates, we're in very early stage uh, discussions, but our estimates show that between, in our vehicle, between 800 and 1,200 PET bottles, recycled PET bottles can be used in the composite cabin, um, which, which will basically sort of go a long way to uh, keeping keeping PET out, out of the oceans, off the streets, through a original mobility uh, solution. So it's a, it's a um, what's the word? It's a, um, a, a benefit that we weren't thinking of initially. We were thinking more of um, the, the time people would save in, uh, by uh, using our vehicles. We could, uh, the, the vehicles that we've developed, the vehicle that we've developed uh, takes one sixth of a traditional parking space. Um, IBM did a study a, a few years ago where they, uh, they showed that on average, it takes you 16 minutes to find a parking space. 30% of vehicles within a city center are driving around looking for parking. Right. So if you can re if you can reduce those uh, those numbers, you can uh, a reduce the amount of space you need for parking. Right? So i.e. you can sort of as we as we say in our promotional film, rip up swathes of concrete and replace them with lush green gardens. Um, so uh, as I say, that the benefit with the pet bottles wasn't something that was in our initial initial sort of business uh, plan, but it's something that we're very seriously considering. And it, it was a pos it wasn't in our initial business plan because the technology is quite uh, it's quite new, so like four four or five years old. But it's something that we're um, we're looking to adopt and sort of keeping keeping all options open to uh, to make our solution even greener than uh, than it already is. Yeah, um, um, thank you very, thank much, you very much for this one. one. Um, um, I'm only going to leave in five minutes. Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, follow up with you on with the question. I know that the trigger solution is actually, like, you're working with cities, uh, with municipalities. That's and, right. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit, and cities, they need to tra tra transform and they are transitioning. Um, towards uh, more livable cities, uh, being more uh, citizen friendly, green friendly, and so on. How is this experience of yours uh, of collaborating with cities and municipalities um, in the because it's like transition by design that you are part of uh, of the of the journey? Yeah. Uh, what would you share? Yeah. Yeah, but our product, the, the Trigo, I don't know how much you, you know about the video. I mean, it's, it's, it's a unique product in itself where the uh, it combines the benefits of a motorcycle and a, and a car. Yes, it's a fully contained cabin, air conditioned um, or uh, or heated for, uh, for two people. And the so it gives you the comfort of a, a vehicle. And uh, it's much, much safer than a scooter or a bicycle or a motorbike but it gives you the flexibility of a scooter on a motorbike because it's literally when the wheels come back in, it's only 86 centimeters wide. So you have all the advantages of what, what you call sort of lane splitting, driving through traffic to try and reduce uh, congestion. You can, get in, you can get in and out of, you can complete your first and last mile journey uh, much quicker, safer, compared to a lot of the other micromobility uh, solutions, which is one of our, our, one of our key uh, goals is basically we, if, if you look at the statistics on the number of the increase in accidents and injuries and deaths uh, resulting from e-micro e mobility so electric scooters electric bicycles um, I mean just in, in Barcelona alone um, the accident rate last year jumped up by 380 percent yes almost fourfold right? Munich is uh, also experiencing a lot of um, there, there is, I mentioned Barcelona and Munich because there were specific studies done there on micromobility accidents. 
Um, a lot of cities are now st starting to look at the issues of micromobility. So we've provided a vehicle that has the benefits of some of the smaller micromobility vehicles. It fits into a category called heavy micromobility. It's sort of safer. Um, it provides a solution from day one, i.e. you can park six vehicles in one parking space so you can reduce the, uh, the, the problems of, uh, of, of parking and you, you overcome traffic congestion. But looking to, to answer your question, looking at the way um, cities are currently planning sustainable urban transport, um, more and more cities uh, are thinking, or more and more uh, transport authorities are looking at ways to prevent vehicles, large vehicles, coming into city centres. And our solution is one of the solutions that's being considered as a transport bridge. So um, basically, you would come to a carport on the outskirts of the city. You would then transfer into an urban mobility vehicle and do whatever it is that you wanted to do. So go to your uh, to the shopping precinct, to the hospital, to um, sort of uh, whatever, whatever it is, <laughs> go home even <laughs> if you live in the city centre. We're doing a study with a, um, a transport authority in the United Kingdom later this year as a transport uh, solution, as, as a, a mobility hub solution, as a transport bridge. And the authority is planning to build a whole housing estate for people who agree to leave their cars two, three kilometers away from the estate. So that basically the, the area in which they're living will be much greener, much safer, less polluted, um, and their, um, the, the tests, though, that the pilot study that we're involved in is looking at autonomous vehicles. So vehicles that you can order, you can hail uh, through an application. They arrive to you empty, which is what our vehicle does. Um, the, the way that some uh, auto, um, uh, automated last mile delivery pods uh, function today. So it's a very low level of autonomy, it's level one autonomy. The vehicle arrives uh, empty, you then get into the vehicle, you drive it away yourself. Once you arrive at your destination, the vehicle is autonomously redeployed. It's, it re comes back to a base or to the carport, which allows us to achieve one of our other missions, which are fewer, fewer vehicles for more journeys. Yeah. So autonomy, a lot, a lot of companies today are uh, struggling with trying to provide level four, level five autonomy where a vehicle will drive a passenger around autonomously. It's not something that we believe many people feel comfortable with. Um, it's not, and it's very, very difficult to achieve. However, if you can provide a transport solution autonomously, you, you resolve a huge, huge uh, problems within urban, urban mobility. And that's one of the key, uh, key things that we're working on. Um, I'm like very much looking forward into the testing and and, and applying the the, the the solution of yours in and seeing it, it in Polish cities. I guess you're testing it somewhere already. Where uh, yeah, we're, most of the tests we, we, we do our own sort of internal uh, tests. So you may see the vehicles uh, in and around Warsaw. Uh, and so um, a lot of our uh, a lot of the video footage on our website is is from Warsaw, but you'll also spot that there are. Um, pictures there and footage from uh, Germany, from uh, Belgium. We're now doing extensive um, testing, or we we're starting extensive testing in the UK. We're based at the uh, Hariba Myra Vehicle Testing Facility in Nuneaton, which provides a huge scope uh, to test not only the, um, the dynamics of the vehicle and to sort of work on, on the dynamics, but also on the autonomy, on the connectivity of, of different vehicles. Connected autonomous vehicles is a big uh, it's a big sec section of um, future mobility that uh, I mean, well, I'm, not, I'm not even going to get into it because it's <laughs> it's a huge uh, it's a huge subject. So we're 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 looking to approach um, and, and test our um, our sort of our, our proven solution in many different fields. Currently, we're talking to a number of um, authorities that represent blue light services, so the ambulance, the fire brigade, police service. Well, they see advantages for uh, a vehicle like ours. Um, we're also talking to a number of fleet operators where basically getting people to um, 
people who are prevented from doing their job because they're stuck in traffic or they're looking for parking spaces, these are the, um, we have very clearly defined um, use cases from uh, fleet operators that have come to us and can see the advantages of um, using a vehicle like ours to get a, a nursing, uh, home nursing, home care, res residential nurses. If a nurse can you, through our vehicle, um, if a nurse can visit six patients as opposed to four patients a day because she's not spending that, that time in traffic or, or looking for parking, there's um, a huge benefit uh, not only to the nurse and to the National Health Service, but to society in general. You know? it's, it's, it's people feel more sort of taken, better taken care of. So our, our, our solution is a transport solution, but it does much, much more than that, much, much more. Yeah, yeah, like only from, from what you're sharing, I think a couple of applications already. That wouldn't be obvious at the beginning, probably. So yeah, exactly. that's all about it. Uh, Thank you very much, Adam. I know you will have to leave uh, for exactly. the session probably in a moment. So thank you very much. Uh, it was an honor to, to have you here. Uh, but I would love to move forward because I'm, I'm looking at Michal and Anna, and I know they are eager to speak and to share their experiences. I know Anna, after Adam sharing his experiences, actually right now, like pro probably even wanting to have a conversation with you. So Anna, I'm going to let uh, allow you now to share and and uh, speak up. I would love to uh, get to know more about your experiences. Yes, thank you very much, Anna, um, and very glad to be here. And I was actually very carefully listening to to, to Josh's presentation about circular economy and indeed Adam uh, and a Trigo um, experience. Um, and I'm just wondering. Um, um, from from the financial perspective, whether whether it's difficult for you to, of course, get um, financed your projects and, and and your companies because very often, of course, very innovative solutions, very unique solutions, they might have difficulties um, getting their their the capital and their project financed. Um, what we do at uh, TNE, indeed, it's a transport and environment federation. So we advocate and campaign at the European level for green and, and clean and sustainable transport. Um, I have financial background, so that's why I started from this angle of finance, because indeed economy is all about SMEs, about uh, it's, it's a majority, right, of, of course, of our um, European economy. It's, it's composed of um, SMEs, like over 90 percent, right? Uh, and these are the driver of, of the European um, um, of the European uh, economy, um, and um, of course those companies they must be financed in a certain way, right? Um, so what is um, amazing right now, which is happening at the European uh, Union level, uh, is the um, uh, European Sustainable Finance Agenda, which is a part of, of course, European Green Deal, um, which uh, which basically is commitment of European Union and therefore each uh, and every member state of European Union, including Poland, um, which will need to commit to uh, climate neutrality, right? We will need as a continent need to reach climate neutrality by, by 2050. And the question is how to do that. Um, and of course, we need, I would say, two elements, right? We need innovative uh, ideas. So we need entrepreneurs like, like, like Josh, like, like Adam, um, so, 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 so the companies, right, uh, which will push forward this, um, this transition towards greener and cleaner and, and more sustainable economy of, um, of tomorrow. But at the same time, we need financiers. So here I'm looking also at Michal, because I also would be very much, much looking forward to hear um, your experience. And what we do at um, Transport and Environment is that we advocate, we, we help and we um, co-shape, if you want, we, we shape, we help shaping um, the European legisla legislators um, to make sure that the European sustainable finance agenda is truly sustainable, if you wish. And there are, you've mentioned, Anna, in your, uh, at the beginning of your, of your introduction, you've mentioned indeed that there is there is quite a lot of different elements to this entire sustainable finance agenda. Um, and just very briefly, perhaps to touch upon, uh, is the taxonomy. So first and foremost, to understand and to define, European Union is trying to define um, what is sustainable and what is not. Uh, because over the past years, there they, they have been increasing amount of uh, ESG sustainable funds and, and green products and green loans and everything was green at some point. 
which is amazing. It means that there is demand. It means that there is a lot of ideas indeed. Uh, but 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 European Union said, okay, at some point we need to classify. We need to say what is green and what is not. And and transport and environment indeed we are very actively um, engaged um, in uh, um, in defining. Uh, especially for a transport sector, what does it mean for transport to be sustainable? And the answer is relatively easy. Of course, after it will depend, right? Because we can, we can. Adam was just talking about land transport, right? But of course, water, ships, uh, planes. <clears throat> but for cars, it's it's very easy solution. Just zero tailpipe emission, no so no CO two emission, and as simple as simple as that, right? Um, so that's, that's taxonomy. Taxonomy try to define which uh, economic activities in European Union are sustainable. It doesn't tell you invest or doesn't, invest, but just this is sustainable. This is not. And then, of course, there are plenty of other different elements of this uh, EU legislation, which will, of course, um, um, include disclosure. So how incentivize companies to inform external stakeholders that they are doing a great job. Because I think that we have to also um, change a narrative and and and, and um, make sure that the ESG, so environmental, social, and governance elements, they are not only risks but they are huge opportunities. Perhaps I will uh, close here. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much. We can, and we can yeah continue on on any other topic. Happy happy to develop. We'll follow up in just in a moment, but uh, really eager to to listen to Michal because uh, we need him to int introduce himself also using maybe an, an um, inspiration experience or whatever um, example that that you want Michal to uh, talk to. How do you uh, contribute to the green agenda? Yeah, thank you. It's it's like it, I'm trying to think how am I supposed to shine? It's a little bit like sell me that pen. So, okay, I'll try to sell you that pen. Let me just start by saying that um, we are a VC fund which has some kind of a commercial agenda, obviously, because we have to deliver the return on investment. But also we are trying to uh, we are trying to do these investments in such a way to promote uh, let's say environmental impact yes and we are actively seeking uh, companies in the clean tech sector so to speak now these are two different things let's say saving the planet and making money are usually not the same things and i will come back to that later because now i like to ask myself a question and answer what is actually our product we are not producing anything that we can send you so our product is actually growth this growth is targeted vis-a-vis -vis founders and companies that come to us and vis-a-vis -vis our investors who want to multiply money so let me say a couple of things why we are unique and how we do actually the streak of growing uh, the companies uh, we are unique in, in, in Poland. We are probably the largest fund which is focused on industry, on AI, on Internet of Things and on clean tech because we manage a little bit more than 200 million zloty. Now, this is divided into two sub funds, one for starters and one for CVC companies. So one unique feature is that when you come to us and say, I'm just starting and this is my PowerPoint pitch book, we can give you, let's say, half a million zloty and we can also give you let's say 25 million zloty depending on the stage of your company so i think what is exceptional in our case is this flexibility that we can go a long way from this alone founder with a pitch book to a let's say uh nasdaq listening listing yes we've got six companies in our portfolio right now we are kind of picky people and most of them are in more or less advanced stage of going overseas and expanding multinationally and acquiring new team members and new investors from abroad because we believe that good ideas have multinational potential and the best way actually to grow them is to go abroad. Next thing that I believe is that managing people can be kind of uh, provocatively summed up as finding people who don't need to be managed yes that means that we believe in a so-called delegation of responsibility we make agreement with our companies and we do not interfere too much unless it is needed yes but if things go right we do not interfere 
uh, and we give a lot of let's say creative freedom to people who manage our companies and that usually that usually pays off and uh, perhaps the third thing is that uh, we are open for innovation there is no one innovation uh, blueprint yes that we follow we are living in exciting times when technology is ripe and the amount of information is doubling or quadrupling every given amount of time we've got exceptional chemistry physics uh, we have new developments in quantum computers in big data in uh, blockchain in a number of things so actually in my opinion the winning formula is simply to extract value by superimposing these technologies by overlapping them and by making sure that the right leaders and uh, <clears throat> let's say visionary people are extracting value from those let's say assets which are freely available and uh, clean tech clean tech is very difficult for a number of reasons it's a different um, field of investment let me start by saying that in most cases it is a regulated market because when you speak about water sewage public transportation electricity these are basically regulated industries these are like infrastructure people expect that they are reliable and people expect that they are cheap and you are not supposed to make truckloads of money on them because there are many let's say adverse social effects just think about what happened in texas when people have seen their electricity bills going up the roof yes this is probably impossible to imagine in european context that means that companies will have difficulty to maximize profits and value in such a simple way second thing is that whatever we do we have to observe what is the policy of european union because there is an abundance of funds and of methods to stimulate investments also especially the capital intensive investments therefore that you cannot compete with free money and you shouldn't do it actually therefore that limits the scope of uh, value building and of our investment we do believe there is a number of possibilities for instance in service industry just to give you an example building a wind farm or building a pv farm is not something i would consider attractive for a simple reason that you have very well uh, you can <clears throat> actually foresee very well both profits and costs therefore you can foresee very well uh, return on investment on such asset and that's not something we would be looking at but if you are a clever company that maintains these things that uh, models the grid in a smart grid fashion if you are someone who can find value and deliver us the model which is scalable we would love to put money into that uh, one more dimension that i would like to discuss in this is that there are a rather few examples of quality investment proposals because if you look at this so-called green spectrum if you deduct so-called corporate greenwashing yes if you deduct another segment which is let's say i would say fake news the people who come and had, they think they have an idea but this idea is more or less it wouldn't fly yes then the real stuff which is okay is very limited and among this the real stuff which can be scaled and uh, meets the criteria of vc investment is even more um, let's say uh, extraordinary that is why being quite frankly we haven't done any investment yet but there are two things in the pipeline that most likely will come to fruition this year for obvious reasons i cannot comment on that but watch our web page and we'll be very happy to announce that and uh, if i may f finish my um, let's say long speech i'd like to make a point that we are actually cleaning up we are solving problems which shouldn't have happened at all just to give you an example now there is a discussion when you drink your coke you're not allowed to drink a plastic you uh, with plastic straw you may use the metal one you may use the paper one or you may use the uh, let's say pasta one which is quite a cool idea but my my idea is do we really need this straw at all can we simply just stop using straws altogether and solve the problem so 
uh, by, let's say, conscious customer choices, we can really do a lot without engaging a single dollar or zloty from our fund. So to sum up, my message would be stop spending, stop consuming things you don't really need, save the planet, and don't let funds like us make money on clean stuff too easily. Yeah, thank you, Michal. You are really shining here. Um, Thank you. I, I gotta admit, <laughs> like uh, whenever I, I'm listening to you guys, I just realize how vast, like how huge the the, the topic of, of uh, green technologies is. So it's uh, the only thing that I'm thinking around, like what is connecting is actually how systemic the world is, and how we need to also think about whenever introducing changes in one area, how are they interconnected and 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 how do they impact and influence other areas and whether those changes can can actually be synergetic and can we think about the world we live in as a system that is really connected and anticipate what others are doing it's just impossible to uh to to do anything there without being in constant um uh, contact with with the outside world with uh, like networking talking to people trying to designing the future together with the community we are uh, we, we live in, but we but the solution that is impacting the community also. Um, we've heard a little bit about like how to finance uh, green solutions. Uh, Michal has also also touched upon how good ideas usually have international potential. So I'd love to hear from Josh your experience about how is it to scale, how is it to run a startup in Poland, and how is it um, uh, what, what's your approach to internationalizing your business yeah well uh so maybe i'll start off with with, with talking about like you know the possibilities of scaling you know uh, internationally um and uh well really it's uh you know anything is possible right of course you know you can there's many things you can do but of course there's also you need to see a reality right for example you know let's say we have anybody you have a business and you have this very wonderful idea that you know you know you wake up in the morning and you're like it's the perfect solution right but in reality you know that solution may not work in another country you know there's a, a variety of factors that come into hand you know when introducing new technologies such as you know uh trade policies you know uh, such as uh, protection of intellectual rights uh and so on you know the cost of living the cost of uh, you know these commodities that it takes to make this this technology and uh, that is one one huge and very important factor in terms of scaling in other countries um so for example here in poland um i can say that uh starting a business was uh, one of the best one of the, one of the best decisions that we could make was starting this uh, our business in poland why well because in poland especially now because of the you know certain pressure from the you know eu and the rest of the world um there's a lot of help you know for, for for entrepreneurs for 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 people who want to start you know companies and make a change you know there's a lot of help you know i can say personally coming from california com coming from the us um that i don't know you just you just don't seem to find so much help uh when you compare it to the eu i mean just the eu is just the the leader in terms of i would say green innovation so you know we found that that starting a company here in Poland has been quite helpful. However, there is this other issue that you come across in terms of scaling up anywhere in the world, and that's uh, the mentality, you know, cultural barriers, you know, just the way that you see things. Um, so one issue that one trouble that we've had starting uh, our company here, especially for the type of company is, is the, you know, the mentality, the support of Oh, you know, can it happen? Or when will it happen? You know, so many times we're faced with uh, um, with individuals who, you know, who can think quite negatively. You know, probably because they're so used to seeing, you know, the, um, you know, uh, uh, they're so used to a linear economy, or they're so used to seeing, you know, new technologies being introduced and failed. You know, who knows? But that is one issue that we had, uh, that we have had. But at the same time. You know, in the, the younger generation and the more pe that we talk about this, the more support we also are getting here, especially in Poland. Um, you know, there's there's many things here that, that we're very grateful. There's many boundaries here that, that have been quite difficult for us to surpass, uh, especially me, you know, coming to coming to coming to Poland. You know, you imagine you're from you're from Southern California 
and then you know you fly and you land and you live in this little village here in Poland, which is which is my story. Uh, you know, and had to deal with all the the culture barriers, the languages, uh, just the, the different bureaucracy. Um, so these are the, the I would say some of the biggest issues when starting a company and trying to spread technology. It's just there's a variety of differences. It's not as simple as you think, and this is what uh, unfortunately sometimes holds technologies back. You know, take solar panels for example. You know, right now there's there's a massive boom in renewable energy. Um, but it's not new. It's not new technology. It's been out there for decades. You know, a long, long time. But you know, that's what's what what's been do what's been going on the whole time is you know that um, that that time that's been put into research into development. You know, it's uh, the continued support, maybe the lack of confidence from investors. You know, because of the return on investment. You know, might you know it might take a long time to see any 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 gains. You know, so it's uh, these are some very difficult things. But when you ask me if, if green technologies are possible to be scaled, I would say yes, they are. However, it's not as easy as it seems. Oh my God, Josh, you've just made the, the topic even wider, uh, adding a very important issues around cultural, cultural backgrounds, behavior of people and how, how does that influence the markets and the, the solutions that, that uh, the market provides to people. This is just really, really amazing. Thank you very much for sharing uh, your experience. Uh, and I guess you do have this factor of, of like the wow factor or or even a, a from a t totally different world, like um, uh, end of the world uh, factor when you just are amazed with what, how does the business run and how do you do business in Europe, actually. Uh, I immediately thought about Mariana Matsukato's entrepreneurial state where she was actually um, revealing how, how many corporates like American uh, based corporates have have also received uh, government um, support and people just don't know about it like everything like everything that's innovative is actually at some point really supported by governments it's very much obvious in um, in Europe I guess um, so maybe Anna can you uh, just say in a few words because we are gonna close in a couple of moments this session but maybe you can share like what this EU taxonomy uh, is about and why businesses should look look at it. Yes, Anna, thank you. EU taxonomy, again, as I said before, it's one of the puzzles, of course, of the wider sustainable finance agenda. But it is important. Why? Because it really, it's kind of, if you wish, a dictionary, right? It's kind of a classification tool, uh, which takes an economy as such, split it, into economic activities and say, define what is sustainable and what is not sustainable. And um, it's, it's very, I would say, the approach, the European approach here uh, is very methodological, if you wish. So it's a very research approach, right? So European Union, knowing that we, we, we need to become a climate neutral by 2050, um, said, okay, how, how shall we go about it, right? So how to make sure that sustainable finance is really sustainable? And Europe in this sense was very, again, as I said, research uh, kind of approach. Okay, let's first and foremost define what is sustainable. And so this is taxonomy. Taxonomy as such, if you want, that, that's why I'm trying to say in the simplest possible way that it's just kind of a dictionary. It's, yeah. it's a, yeah, yeah. I'm just very much curious, Michal, had you had a chance to look into the EU taxonomy so far? Well, uh, being frank and honest, not really. I know there is a number of, uh, let's say, information systems that usually overwhelm me, so I rely on some kind of external experts. <laughs> Michal, what's about uh, sustainable finance disclosure regulation, right? Because there is a variety after, because that's why I was saying taxonomy is part of a regulation, but another part of a sustainable finance agenda and the bigger puzzle is for all the financial market players to actually disclose, disclose to the end users, to the investors, how sustainable they are. So I was wondering whether, for example, you heard anything about the sustainable finance disclosure regulation or not? <laughs> I mean, there is a lot of people who are actually <clears throat> helping con large companies to present what they are doing is uh, in, in that field, exactly, yes. This is required, for instance, to issue green bonds, or this is required to uh, put in your annual report and that's a great thing yes because actually i happened to read this even last two, uh, last couple of days to see how serious that is and i think it's a good beginning and we should go into that direction the thing is that 
I find it kind of puzzling to, let's say, measure this because it looks good. For instance, we can measure carbon footprint, but we do not measure water footprint. We do not measure methane footprint. We do not measure plastic footprint when we drop stuff into the ocean and fish are dying, or we are not measuring, for instance, rare earth metals footprint wherever we discard our mobile phone. So yes, go into that direction, but build some kind of, let's say, reliable uh, green controlling, so to speak. So we can really estimate, yes, the impact, the real f environmental footprint. This is obviously the step into the right direction. Thank you very much, Michal and Anna. I love the fact that we've, we are finishing our conversation with touching impact, because this is, I, I guess, the why we are actually all into uh, the what and what. And what we are doing is actually because of the fact that we are purpose driven and we want to see impact, we want to see the transition happening, the change happening. And I guess each and every of us wants to live in a um, beautiful world in 20 years from now. Um, and let's stick to this thought. Let's not forget um, uh, action. Um, the second thing I, I also had, had a reflection that I love is around we will never we are never able to finish those conversations. And this is great and, and beautiful about it. Uh, how many new topics and and uh, and areas there are to actually uh, open up the magic of of uh, the green technologies, not only technologies, the green solutions. Uh, for our futures. Thank you very much um, to Anna, to Michal and to Josh and also to Adam who's, who's now probably waving at some other session uh, also saying goodbye. Hope to see you uh, soon again and let's network in the other sessions uh, still today. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon.